people are joining in i will let them in and uh, uh, we are here with a session called as lecture 2 named as what is marxism indeed and very important question for all of us to know and this session is basically uh, you know organized by on behalf of bread and roses in lsr and in collaboration with satyam reading uh, circle of st stephen's college and uh, let me introduce you all to our guest speaker comrade prabud so prabhu singh is a phd research fellow in sociology at ambedkar university delhi he works on an agrarian relations rural sociology and caste in particular and marxist critic of political economy in general so are, we are going to have very good session today on what is marxism now i would request comrade prabud if you can take the session ahead and provide us the knowledge about the topic what is marxism first of all thank you very much to uh, bread and roses for inviting me to take this lecture on what is marxism and also satyam reading circle of st stephen's college am i audible okay so one thing i would like to share at the very behest that uh, if someone says that i'm very knowledgeable and i can teach you something then that person doesn't know anything we all are learners we all are learning at our own pace some are advanced learners some are basic learners so the task of the study circle is always that someone who is uh, gone through those readings and has a certain uh, reflections on that that person can share with that those reflections with others so that others can also have a guide have a beacon light that how to uh, go ahead while going through a certain reading so the topic uh, so first of all let me ask uh, is there anyone who is not comfortable in hindi because i will be speaking bilingually if uh, there is someone who is not at all Uh, comfortable with hindi then i can continue major part in english otherwise i can be bilingual in between uh i think more or less everyone will understand both the languages so it will be fine so first of all when we are saying what is marxism so it's something that if you ask your college professors uh, ma'am what is marxism they will give very vague answers everyone uh, even i have done this kind of a thing that i will go and ask uh, what is marxism they will say oh marxists are those people who fight for the working class marxists are those people who are just armchair intellectuals so marxists are those people who fight on the streets everyone will have their own reflection of what is marxism but they don't actually teach you that what actually is marxism even in our courses which we study is like sociology political science or history we understand certain applications of marxism over there but not the core of marxism and that is why when even people when they come to phd they just think that marx oh, it's he's just about uh, critiquing political economy so if you just want to understand capitalism and understand certain aspects of labor relations then marx is okay perfect fine but apart from that marx has no currency then you have to go around wandering so let me start to this lecture so it will be in a lecture format because uh, i think in the online mode having a discussion one on one discussion becomes very much difficult first of all i have shared a reading with you all uh, in the messages which is uh, engels burial speech so basically when marx died engels gave a very short speech at his burial and it is one of the classic crisp in a crisp format where you can see that what actually is marxism so if you go to the third paragraph i will just read it verbatim for everyone to understand and i would also urge everyone to read it at the same time just as darwin discovered the law of development or organic nature so marx discovered the law of development of human history the simple fact hitherto concealed by an overgrowth of ideology that mankind must first of all eat drink have shelter and clothing before it can pursue politics science art religion etc that therefore the production of the immediate material means and consequently the degree of economic development attained by a given people or during a given epoch for, form the foundation upon which the state institutions the legal conceptions art and even the ideas of religion of the people concerned have been evolved and in the light of which they must therefore be explained instead of vice versa as had hitherto been been the case so basically itna bada paragraph hai what does engels wants to uh, engels want to say in this paragraph engels yahi baat bol raha hai that just like darwin what did darwin get Darwin gave a theory of evolution that uh, from a certain cell how a big organism came into being and from that how different uh, 
species came into being. So Marx also gave a theory of evolution of human societies in a historical uh, format. And what he is saying is very simple, which we generally go on. Kibhasha we listen to him. Roti kapda makan. Before doing anything else, what drives human uh, history is its material needs. A child, when it is born, it cannot speak, it cannot showcase its emotions. But when it is hungry, when it wants to uh, go uh, discharge its urine or anything, it cries. It has certain material needs. It expresses it into a certain form, and that is just not the case for everything. The baseline is your material needs. You are eating. Your other uh, material needs, your clothing, your shelter, these are the basis of a, and foundation of a human society. And everything else, be it your art, your culture, your religion, or whatever which has been formed in the historical development of his, human societies or human history per se, is based upon this foundation. So this is the foundation, and any kind of explanation of an ideological growth. Be it in the form of religion, be it in the form of any other kind of an idea, be it gender, be it caste, be it anything else, anything else, has to be explained in terms of its material foundations. That is the crux of Marxism, and we will try to understand that how Marx actually came to this conclusion. So first of all, we must understand that what Marxism is not. The second part, if we are having this vague idea that Marx talks about the material basis of human society. how it uh, uh, originates how it develops and how it uh, leads to the formation of various social uh, institutions which we see around us so next question comes and what not is marxism so marxism is not theology theology by theology we mean that uh, some god or some creator has said that this is going to happen and the human society is arranged around that thing marxism is not theology marx is not a prophet Marx is not saying that I have written this book and the human society will follow this book. And Marxists are those idiots who just blindly follow that book and say that we will create a book, uh, we cre create the world according to this book because the book says so. We are the uh, other side of people. Why I am saying that because Marxists uh, are not dogmatic. You must have heard many a times from your professors as well that Marxists are dogmatic, dogmatic, dogmatic. Basically, dogmatism. Actually, in philosophy, means it leads to crass materialism. We will come to that in the uh, next five to ten minutes. What dogmatism actually means? Marxism, uh, if in a single line, if anyone asks you that what is Marxism, then Lenin gave a very famous quote, which means concrete analysis of concrete conditions. So, what does concrete analysis means, and what is what are the concrete conditions? For that, you have to understand that Marxism, before being a theory or a politics. It's a philosophy. So, before, without understanding the philosophical background of Marxism, understanding theory or the practice of Marxism becomes impossible. If you just see, for example, the Kisan movement is going on. If you see people over there who are saying, recently in Muzaffarnagar, a random uh, farmer said, "Our fight is against capitalism, and the capitalism is the core of our uh, problems, and we have to overcome it." Many people would say that this guy has gone mad. He does not understand anything, and why he is just saying capitalism. But if you want to understand how he came to that conclusion per se, you have to understand the philosophical background of Marxism, what it says about class contradictions, and how it is actually entailing into the uh, ongoing movements. Also, Marxism is not something separate or different from it. It's in our daily lives. It's in our uh, Class politics and it is also in our movements which are going on all around us. So let me just very briefly come to. I will go through various terminologies or the basic foundational stones of Marxism, and try to build upon a say a random, not a random person, but a, a very rudimentary kind of understanding. See, in a one-hour lecture, no one can teach you Marxism. It took me ten years to actually basically read Capital Volume One. so it's not a one hour thing that in one hour i can teach you that oh now you're uh, baptized in marxism so now you go out and you practice marxism but what i can actually uh, tell you in this class is that what are the foundational key concepts on which you can uh, move ahead to learn and understand marxism better so first of all what we have to understand is materialism that what is actually materialism so when we talk about materialism so its counter also comes to our mind which is idealism so idealism means 
for example if someone some of your friend comes to your college in the canteen he says after college i will join some big mnc i will become a next ambani i will open a startup i will become this i will become that and then you say idiot you are not even able to pay your fees and you are saying this kind of a thing firstly you should understand your own location and try to fix that material condition of yours so you, what your friend is actually going through is an idealism he is just uh, thinking something in his mind and saying that i will bring it into reality and what you are saying is that you should do a reality check with yourself that what uh, actually uh, you have in your hand so materialism is not about materials per se that you have a phone in your hand or your book in your hand that is just materialism materialism means that the real things with which you interact in your daily life and which are present across the world in actually across the universe the planets the moons the food you eat the air you breathe it's all a part of materialism and what idealism says is that the any kind of an explanation for example if you look at the renaissance period uh, which happened in uh, europe uh, in the 15th to 16th century ad what uh, scientists were saying is that uh, till then all the explanation of the world were given in idealist sense so for example the earth is flat why because the bible says so because this book says so because our some uh, priest says so but then scientists say no we will have to prove it then galileo came copernicus came everyone came they built up their own models they verified it and then said no the earth is uh, round and they were castrated uh, by the uh, church as well i think galileo was hanged uh, in the middle of the road as well was saying that the earth is round so what we are saying is that earlier kind of a definition which was coming out was an idealist thing that we have formed a certain notion and this is how reality is and reality should be but then someone is saying no we have to scientifically verify that what actually is happening and uh, through what we can observe so what we all must have learned in school the scientific temperament or the scientific method in our science classes physics chemistry or other classes that you take a certain assumption you uh, perform a certain experiment you draw certain conclusions and then you verify it verify or you refute uh, your assumptions and come up with a thesis so this is called a scientific method marxism is nothing but science it's not a creation of uh, someone's just uh, fancy uh, idealism it is a science of understanding a material reality and how do you uh, understand it to change it change it is a very important part you will also come it by the end of the lecture but uh, it's a scientific method it's a science and with every science you have to understand its rules its methods and how it is to be implemented all these things are very important marxism is not just i feel marxism should be like this marxism should be like that it's not about morality also that this is right this is wrong so whatever is right it should be marxism whatever is wrong should be marxism it is talking about concrete analysis concrete conditions whatever there is you have to understand it that's very much clear you, you have to be objective in your analysis of marxism so we understand what is materialism and how it is different from idealism materialism means the things which you are really existing in your uh, surroundings in your life and in nature in general next thing which comes is uh, how do you understand uh, the relation the nature i am talking about nature and, and as in the characteristics of uh, materialism one is uh, mechanistic so mechanistic school mein hum logo ne newton ke laws padhe the uh every action has an equal and opposite reaction if you throw a certain thing it will move at a certain velocity speed time and all this that what it uh, assumed is that uh, there is a certain matter which has uh, its fixed properties and through external force it is uh, creating certain uh, movement and you are studying that movement it's therefore called mechanistic physics as well the newtonian physics but uh, that is one form of uh, uh, physics the other form of physics is a dialectics now dialectics what does it mean let me give you a very simple example to understand dialectics dialectics becomes very difficult for people to understand because when they try to understand oh negation of negation one thing is uh, ha happening thesis then antithesis then synthesis comes into being a very simple thing to keep in mind that what is dialectics is to take an example of an atom what is actually is an atom atom has a nucleus in center with the neutrons they are protons 
and there are electrons which are uh, revolving around it you have certain valency valency means that the uh, number of protons should be equal to number of electrons then it becomes a stable atom so stable atom ek aise ban jata hai what we see in uh, an atom is that there are electrons which are very small in size protons which are much larger in size uh, as electrons there are certain properties one a proton is called a positive and electron is called a negative if you take a proton separately and a electron separately it has different properties proton is a different thing it's a positive thing a charge electron is a negative charge the electricity which comes to our home is because of the electrons which are coming but it's separately separated from the atom now when an atom comes into being uh, that into a nucleus all the protons are there and electrons are revolving around it an atom has a different property each atom has a different property so what we are seeing and all atoms are composed of electrons and protons the same electrons and protons are made up, uh, made up in uh, are there in at, uh, each atom so what we understand dialectics simply is that there are two opposites one is a proton one is an electron and by interaction of these opposites they change qualitatively into a newer form which is an atom an atom has a different property than that of an electron or a proton per se so through this simple example which we can, uh, see in our natural life per se which is across the universe this is what dialectics actually means that two things up mutually opposing things with different properties when they interact with each other come into a relationship they transform into a different thing which has a different property which is different properties from the its constituents altogether this is called dialectics thesis say thesis is a proton antithesis is an electron and when they come into being an atom is formed which becomes a synthesis this is called science and this is basic science of dialectics which you can apply everywhere now the question becomes that how do you understand dialectical materialism any people say that marxist philosophy is actually dialectical materialism which is true so one thing which we should understand is that materialism is fixed that you are not going to be an idealist that you are not saying that whatever fancy ideas which come into mind and you think that the world should be like this or world is moving like this you study and understand the real properties of this world and this human history human society per se dialectic means relations of the opposites contradictions become very important so whatever contradictions happen in material life lead to its development i will give you an example to understand it in much easier a fish wants to eat a plankton a plankton an algae or something plankton has a life a fish also has a life fish eats all the plankton so through eating the plankton or the algae which the fish is eating it is consuming other life there is an opposite reaction which is happening but the fish body is growing this is a very rudimentary example which i am giving and there are multiple examples like this another example dialectical materialism how do things oppositely move and create rain happens so rain is what a water which is uh, coming down to your uh, to the soil it interacts with the soil the plant seeds which are over there they absorb nutrients from it within each of these reactions there are opposite things which are happening rain's properties are when it interacts with the soil it transforms into something another when it is absorbed by the plant or the seed its properties become different so dialectical materialism is actually this that everything in uh, natural world not just in human society is interconnected with each other and how do they interact with each other each individual thing interacting with the other thing is through dialectics is through opposites they both contest with each other contestation is a natural law of, uh, is a is a natural law per se sometimes we read that uh, competition and cooperation the dialectics and mostly in philosophy political science we read there that is human society based on competition or cooperation the fundamental thing is that human society or be it natural world both are based on contradictions if someone wants to grow it has to eat something other if the, that person if the other being has to live then it has to evade getting eaten getting eaten by the other being this is a fundamental form of uh, contradiction which we see in every 
living or non-living matter and not just humans humans are not aliens we are also natural beings we are a kind of a we are a species of uh, animals also so we should never think that human society is a different thing so that is why sometimes when we see that natural sciences is called bsc bachelor's of sciences but when we study human societies we become bachelor of arts and this kind of a distinction that human societies should be understood in a different manner than that of the natural world it's a dubious and a very fruitless kind of a distinction which has been made because earlier if you remember the uh, our grandfathers generation they all read every uh, kind of a subject in their graduation it was a general uh, graduation which they used to do they, they would read mathematics they would read physics they would read everything in fact marx himself was also a mathematician he, he wrote uh, uh, two books on mathematics as well so this the kind of distinction that you, either you are a science person or an arts person this does not exist in real world then next thing which uh, comes to our mind is that historical materialism marxist philosophy is actually historical materialism till now whatever tits and bits we will try to understand what the basic concepts what is materialism what is dialectics what is dialectical materialism historical materialism means when applied to human history you when you apply dialectical materialism to human history how humans who were living in caves in africa expanded all over the world got into agriculture produced fire before it then came iron age bronze age got into agriculture build up feudal societies then uh, build up certain kingdoms fought wars over it private property was there how all these things came into being from its origin till today till today means uh, when we are living in a capitalist world today this story of human life how are you going to understand and explain it for that explanation you need to apply dialectical materialism which is a method to that human history and the kind of analysis which comes out of it becomes a historical materialist analysis for example many historians like irfan habib romila thapar who say that they are marxist historians they apply dialectical materialism to human history and present to you a uh, understanding a uh, narrative of the human history be it ancient history of india or a medieval history of india so this is how marxism which is basically dialectical materialism applied to history becomes a tool to understand our own existence our own being if i was born somewhere say in early 90s the world did not start when i was born i was born into certain social institutions certain kind of a social milieu a certain history was there behind me and i inherited it i interacted it with uh, uh, i interacted with it on my own terms and came into a certain kind of an understanding and explanation of that world today and it is true for every kind of an individual in sociology we often uh, read this kind of a thing that uh, whether individuals run society or social institutions run society it's a many of you who might be sociology students must have uh, known about this kind of a debate which happens in sociology so one thing which we should understand that human societies and human history they preceded our own existences how old we might be 20 30 year old people but capitalism has been there for 200 years so if we think that we are with our own limited understanding of 10 to 15 years whatever we have experienced sometimes we say na experiential knowledge is everything and we don't need to learn about meta narratives about human history about general sciences or anything else how possibly can you even try to understand human history just by your own experiences you have to have a certain kind of a scientific outlook a temperament and a theoretical model to understand human history and place yourself into it then so that's why i initially said that marxism is a science it requires an objective study you can't approach marxism saying that oh in my life i have for example i'm a worker or i'm a farmer or i am a woman or i'm a queer person or i'm from this caste or this tribe or in this nationality i have certain questions and let me see how marxism resolves my questions that is not that is can be a starting point but marxism is not a holy book which you will open and you will find certain answers into it marxism is a science which gives you an understanding that whatever your prob- your problems you are facing today they are not your individual problems they are systematic problems 
and to understand the systematic problems you have to understand the historical origin and functioning of those institutions to change it even to change certain things you have to understand that those things before so that is why marxism becomes an important tool to understand the human history and the social institutions where we are living in so the next part which becomes is after historical uh, materialism another thing which uh, becomes a very key concept in marxism is mode of production so what exactly is mode of production mode of production basically means for example if i want to build this mobile phone how do i build this our interaction with this mobile phone would have been i bought it online i just pay, placed the buy option and it got delivered to me but that was not how this phone was built this phone was built by certain uh, uh, out of certain things there is there are certain elements into its metals silicon which has gone into its rubber glass and everything there are mine workers who would have worked in mine got out those metals then there would have been transport workers who would have uh, uh, brought them to the uh, certain factory from that factory they would have gone to a certain workshop in that workshop there would have been certain technicians engineers certain workers there would have been people who had assembled it then there would have been people who had marketed it shipped it and then you got it into your hand now the question becomes that this mobile phone is not just how you experience your mobile phone there is a whole production process which goes into it and it goes in every kind of a thing even in the basic food which you eat the whole farmer's agitation the movement which is happening is because this production uh, this mode of production thing how it has been changed sought to be changed by the government so if you want to understand farmer agitation understanding marxist analysis of farming or not just farming of the political economy per se becomes very much evident and in fact most of the farmers who are participant uh, in the farmer agitation who are in lakhs and lakhs of numbers have understood this thing and it's not something that oh, if you are studying only in lsr or stephens only then you can understand it a simple person who tries wants to understand his uh, the human history his own problems can understand marxism till now whatever i have taught that might have been a bit uh, heavy also in terms because marxism is not easy it's not as if oh you just give two slogans and you become a marxist or you just take a membership of a certain organization by default you become a marxist marxism is a process it's a long process person so when i'm saying about uh, one second mode of production so mode of production basically means in very simple terms who is producing the goods one one thing and who is enjoying its benefits means in everything you get a net there are two elements one is the natural elements which are uh, natural resources which are using it for example rubber glass or other metals which you take these are natural uh, elements which you are taking from the nature itself then but then there is a labor element which has to work upon this to produce a final product now the question becomes that when this labor who is actually working on those goods and producing certain commodity is the benefit of the production whatever price you are paying for it is uh, being given to those workers those lab uh, the people who are actually doing the labor or is there anyone else who is uh, uh, taking benefit out of it and what is their relationship how it is being uh, configured altogether for example under feudalism what was uh, used to happen is that there was a landlord and there are landlords in certain places in india as well till today so there will be a landlord landlord will say that these 100 acres of land is mine so if you are a farmer if you want to grow your crops on this field okay you are free to uh, grow crops on this uh, 10 acres of land you grow the crops on it but when the harvest season comes i will take one third of your uh, crops as a rent so what does this actually mean that that farmer has put it 100% labor to grow the crops on that 10 acres of land but that landlord who is just sitting in his own haveli and just uh, overseeing that who all are happening and actually doing different forms of operation or might not be doing certain kind of operation as well it's not as if a black and white picture that landlord might be a very good person at heart but the pro point is the relation of production which are coming into being the mode of production is different and relations of production are the relation between those two humans the farmer and the landlord 
mode of production is a system, how it is being configured. So when we are talking about the mode of production in the feudalism, that landlord will take one third of your produce, no matter how good or bad a person that person is, whether that person is a white or a brown, whether that person is an upper caste, is an OBC or an SC or whatever caste, class, gender of that person. Class is a different thing, but caste, gender, or any kind of a social location, whether that person is a woman or a, a man, that does not matter. What matters is the relation of production, which is a very objective understanding which we are talking about. So it's not uh, as if we, when we Marxists say that Adani Ambani Murdabad, it's not that uh, I have certain kind of a Khandani Dushmani with Adani or Ambani. It's because of their position in the mode of production which which we criticize. So that they are monopoly capitalists. That is why we are criticizing them. It's not to say that Adani is per se a bad person. He might be a very good person to hang out with, but in the mode of production. Yes, in this as a position of a monopoly capitalist, that is what we are criticizing. So this understanding is very much essential. That we are, what when we say Marxism, it's a science and it has to be objectively studied. You can't bring in your morality question into it. So I guess mode of production thing under feudalism is very clear. Under capitalism, it's a very it's a bit tricky question. So under capitalism, what happens is that you invest a certain money. Uh, for example, if you want to put up a factory, you take certain money. Now the question of uh, where do this um, does this money come from is a different thing altogether. And and important thing is that, for example, if you invest 100 crore rupees, set up a factory of, say, producing mobile phones. Now the workers who are producing goods over there, you are paying them, say, 5,000, 10,000 rupees as monthly wages. But the value of the mobile phones which those workers are producing cumulatively is say for example 10 crore rupees per month and the wages which they are receiving is only say 1 crore rupees. Now the question becomes where does this 9 crore rupees of labor is going? So that 9 crore of, uh, rupees of labor is what is technically called. We are not saying he, the capitalist might be a good person, bad person that might be Tata, Villa or Adani, Ambani or that might be you or me also. That 9 crores worth of value of labor is being exploited by the capitalist of the workers. This is baseline definition of exploitation. And exploitation and operation are different terms. Operation means a social operation. Exploitation is a technical term, which means when your surplus value of labor, surplus value means you produce 10 uh, crore uh, worth of goods, you are getting only 1 crore uh, uh, as wages. So the remaining 9 crore is your surplus value. So that surplus value when it is being appropriated by someone other uh, someone other class person. That class is the bourgeoisie, what we call it. It's a French term, but we can also say capitalist. So when that capitalist takes that 9 crore rupees and you're left only with 1 crore rupees in hand, we say that you are being exploited and that 9 crore rupees uh, worth of your surplus value is being, has been exploited. This is the crux of capitalism that capitalism grows on the basis of exploitation. And now the question that where did that capital of 100 crore rupees come from? That actually came from capital itself. That from these 9 crore of rupees, the capitalist might spend 2 crores or 4 crores, 5 crores of rupees. But the remaining uh, 4 or 5 crore rupees, he will invest into another firm to gain more profits out of it. That is how capitalism expands and reproduces itself. Through... So, this is another lecture this will extend can extend into how political economy under capitalism works but this is the baseline of understanding of how marxism understand now let's revise one thing when we said dialectical materialism or historical materialism how does that uh, relate with this political economic understanding of exploitation under feudalism or see capitalism one thing dialectics was about contradictions there's an inherent contradiction between the interests of the working class of that workers who got only one crore rupees and the capitalist. That capitalist will also want that the workers who are getting one crore should not even get one crore. They should only work for 50 lakh rupees. So their both class interests are antagonistic to each other. There's an inherent contradiction built into the model of capitalism. This is what we call a dialectic. So there is a complete contradiction which works out in the political economy and why it is materialism because your production process is involved into it. So there's a material uh, act which you are engaging into which is inherently contradictory 
and this is what capitalism is and it the whole structure is built around it the next thing which comes into um, understanding is fundamental law of social development we understood relations of production which are contradictory in nature there are workers and there are capitalists who have an inherent contradictory class uh, interest now the question comes what about class ideas class rule about uh, different structures say state or other social activities uh, or your social identities which are formed around it how do they fit into this whole schema okay till now the professor they would say marxism is fine up to this stage it understands very well how political economy works how labor relations are being formed but how does it translate into human society one thing which we said in the starting is that marxism is a science it's a general theory of nature and human history person now what we have to understand that this bourgeoisie that this capitalist who is uh, taking a 9 crore worth of surplus value has to maintain its class rule if for example all the workers knew that we produce 10 crore rupees worth of goods and we got only 1 crore rupees as our wages and that uh, uh, bloody capitalist that person took 9 crore worth of uh, goods worth of value from me so let's unite and overthrow this capitalist and then the remaining 9 crore we can uh, utilize it for our own well being that will be a revolutionary thing which would happen and the capitalist will never want that revolution thing to happen he won't want to justify that exploitation so what uh, how does capitalist do this this it becomes a class idea so what we call bourgeois ideology or bourgeois uh, interests or bourgeois uh, art that actually is that so for example india how may india has now say 20 billionaires and uh, in the forbes list and it is needs to be celebrated our uh, adani and ambani are the world's uh, say asia's richest people and we have to take pride into it one example another example if you work hard you become rich and uh, what did steve jobs say be uh, foolish be something something with that kind of a thing so what capitalists actually try to tell you and even in our universities what they tell us that if you work hard you will become rich no matter if you are born into a working class family whatever the social society be for example i was told when i came to delhi to study that if you study till phd you will get a very uh, decent and comfortable government job i also agreed to that idea okay if you work hard and i was also told that you should not engage into any kind of a politics and not be politically very vocal and uh, you just focus on your academic work and you will get a very good job now when the national education policy is coming in i am not going to be political for example a very a political person who is just concentrated on their uh, education because everyone says that if you are good well educated you will get a very good job national education policy is coming it is saying that all permanent government jobs in education sector will be gone and they will only be contractual jobs on 3 or 4 uh, 3 or 5 years in your basis now all my dreams of getting a decent government job in which i will also have a certain amount of pension where i will retire in 60 years i will build a home in the hills will make a library over there are shattered all my idealist dreams are shattered now i will have to go to a certain private college or du colleges which will become quote unquote autonomous go into those colleges teach for 5 years and also within those 5 years if i even say one thing that this is wrong for example if your hostels are not being opened up and students are not able to come to the university and many students who able to get a comfort a decent uh, internet coverage and i'm uh, skipping classes and i demand that students should be allowed to come into hostel if the administration sees that oh, this person is raising a political demand and he should be kicked out i will be kicked out i can't go to court so i will not be able to go anywhere because that's in my contract terms so by being a political quote on quote and being completely away from any kind of a political understanding of how world works nothing is going to be changed i am just a pawn in the whole a cog in the wheel per se that the wheel is turning and you are asked to be a cog in the wheel and be silent about it whatever is happening you just uh, give certain kind of an explanation 
for example if uh, i am not able to get a job the bjp rss will tell me oh it's not because of you it's because the muslims are uh, 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 procreating at a very fast pace so what you actually need is not uh, to take back a national education policy but a population control bill is very necessary in up and you should vote the government based on it this is how bourgeois ideology actually trans uh, 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 works it deviates us from understanding our own base class basis our own class interest our class interest is that we should get the capitalist kicked off get the remaining 9 crore worth of surplus value for us and build a better sustainable equitable society for everyone that is a basic rational understanding marxists are not saints or anything we are just talking about the basic contradiction in uh, human society and saying it needs to be resolved for the better and that is just the revolutionary thing which we are saying as marxists now to move away the question from that to move the question away from that basic dilemma we will be taught no the but the fight is on the basis of religion see the farmers who are agitating are not agitating because uh, their livelihoods are at stake they are agitating because they want khalistan because they are ch- uh, funded by china uh, these people ke- uh, are actually uh, not all the farmers these are rich farmers or poor farmers these are upper caste or obcs or dalits so you should vote party based on your own caste location but not on your class interest class interest comes secondary what you should be aware uh, that oh that person from that class or that religion is getting benefits so that how is that person getting benefits so that this whole ideological overgrowth which also engels said in his speech at marx burial is based on this own material understanding that at the end of, end of the day be it congress or be it bjp adani ambani's profits are going to be continued this is a baseline understanding that even if you kick out bjp tomorrow it might be a good thing in the sense that the hindu you might be able to stop certain uh, hindutva politics in this country but the baseline is not going to be changed in the farmers movement also uh, many a times we say that uh, just changing the government because when asked about mission up which was declared recently in uh, muzaffarnagar that we have to kick out bjp government many people clearly said that just kicking out bjp government will not do anything we have to change the system and how we, and f- what the changing system mean for us that the rule of workers and the peasants should be established the simple thing which marx also said dictatorship of the proletariat now many liberals uh, get frowned at this term when they uh, hear the word dictatorship of the proletariat but we are already living in a dictatorship we have nominal democracy a constitutional form of democracy but we are living under the dictatorship of capital if you are not going to get up tomorrow go to work 9 to 5 you are not going to get your uh, bread bread roti or whatever we all might be eating you're not going to be able to pay your electricity bills you're going to be kicked on the streets and even on the streets you would be kicked by the policeman you are forced into a certain to participate into the capitalist mode of production forced in the sense that if you don't participate in it you will starve to death and this is a, not a hyperbole but this is actually reality people die of uh, many children die of malnutrition killed it why are they dying if you just ask i guess premchand ye baat bolte the ki kuch log uh, bhooke ko roti dal ke poonde samajhte hain ki bhooka hai if someone is hungry you go and feed them you feel very happy about it uh, i ask uh, why is he hungry and uh, people call me communist So that is just a difference between Marxists and being a, say, a liberal good heart person. That uh, if you find someone who is hungry, you just go and feed them uh, uh, some rotis and click a good selfie, put it on your Instagram page, get certain likes, and that is fine. I'm not saying that it's wrong in a certain manner. At least that person is ha- able to eat a uh, one-time person. But if you ask why is this person hungry in the first place, why is there no right to food? why because capitalists don't want that uh, your food should be available to uh, as a right to everyone because how uh, how then they will earn profits by selling your biscuit 
the parli ji biscuit of 5 rupees which you get it does not even cost more than 10 to 20 paisa to the company even the water bottle which you buy for 20 rupees the bisleri bottle ask your shopkeeper for how much cost does that person get 2 and a half or 3 rupees 17 rupees profit is earned by the company and the shopkeeper that is how capitalism works and everyone uh, in the ideological sphere that is why when we say that uh, social sociology is a bourgeois discipline many people this has been also a debate in sociology as well that in sociology we read about everything intersectionality postmodernism critical theory this theory that theory but sometimes this ideological overgrowth to understand everything misses out the basic point from where we are starting that we are creature who need food water shelter and these are basic things and the politics and the human society has to be based upon the principles where everyone gets this that's why the goal the next thing which comes into uh, being that what is the goal of marxism the goal of marxism is scientific socialism scientific socialism now why i'm saying scientific socialism not just socialism socialism many people might think that everyone should be happy living in a la la land there should be no one in tears and everyone will live happily ever after a utopia bliss kind of a thing where everyone will live that will be socialism but that's utopian socialism and marx was very critical about it in his own time there were many french socialists uh, in his own era who were utopian socialists who said that capitalism is bad because it's morally reprehensible it's very bad that the children are made to work for 12 to 14 hours in the factories in the dungeons and this should not happen and that's why capitalism is bad marx said that's fine but when you're saying it's bad it has to be objectively objectively proved for example earlier the slave owners used to have a uh, stakes and different kind of a thing to beat the workers and get them uh, to work for example in america uh, before the civil war in southern uh, parts of america the blacks were uh, sold as slaves and they were white uh, land owners also sometimes they were black land owners as well uh, so they uh, they would uh, make them work they would uh, kill their children or sell their children they would rape their women and it was seen as very morally reprehensible by the north that this thing is happening after the civil war the same black people were working in factories were still demanding for their rights they were still made to work for 12 to 14 hours but now instead of the slave owner with a gun or a stick in his hand there was an hr manager with a very suited booted with a good tie in a proper english who would ask you that how are you how are you doing so that is how things have changed that this superficiality which capitalism has developed it's part of its ideological growth that how it makes you feel happy so for example when you join a new company or a new they say welcome to the family we all, all live as a family over here and uh, uh, any kind of a problem you have you talk, uh, contact your hr and that but they won't say tell you okay we will make you work for 12 hours we will pay you uh, we will be earning uh, nearly 10 lakh rupees per month with your labor and we will only be paying you 20000 and if on above of that if you take a leave we will cut your salary and plus that we will also be cutting the taxes from your salary they don't tell that on, on the joining letter na they would tell you welcome to your family and this that so that's how capitalism through its ideological edifice through dif- different social institutions tries to cover its basic inherent functioning which is based upon capitalist exploitation of workers surplus labor now one second <clears throat> uh just a last thing uh, couple of last things now what is marxism till now we have understood that okay marxism is objective it's scientific understanding but is marxism just a thing to be discussed in class and to be understood to be written in notes and exams and yeah yeah happy lala land marxism actually uh, lenin used to uh, call them pristine philosophers the university philosophers 
basically our class uh, people like us who are in universities and colleges doing phds or whatever we talk about uh, radically talk about many things we will abolish gender we will abol we are anti capitalist we are this we are that we will remove caste from this uh, on the face of this country uh, and this that we write a lot about it and we say we put quotes by marx by lenin by ambedkar by this by that but what actually are we contributing that is also something also we need to understand because how do you contribute that also becomes a point one thing as a marxist if you understand that the primary contradiction in a society is based on relations of mode of production it's in the mode of production and through relations of production it's between the workers and the capitalists that this is the basic contradiction it's a universal law it's not just it's in india or it's in up or it's just in delhi or it's just in america this is how human history in the current epoch is throughout the globe a amazon which is in america headquartered in america sells its goods across the world exploits labor across the world tesla which sells uh, its cars be, uh, made in usa makes uh, child uh, makes children work in mines in latin america so it's all connected all over the world there's no exceptionalism that america is, is an exception or india is an exception we are all interconnected one thing which we learned in a uh, uh, dialectical materialism as well that everything in this world is interconnected with each other and it has a contradictory re relationship with each other so when uh, talking about um, what marxism is so this is his book dialectical materialism by morris confort i would suggest this book it's a very concise book you can get it for say 300 400 200 bucks so it's published by akar so the first sentence which this book says dialectical materialism is a revolutionary philosophy of the working class it is a philosophy of the revolutionary working class party marxism does not belongs to us belong to us basically it does not belong to universities it does not belong to students it does not belong to young people it does not belong to people who are just thinking that we want to create a better world it does not belong to us marxism belongs to workers marxism belongs to farmers the peasants marxism ka basic analysis humne samjha the contradiction is between capitalists and the people who the capitalism is exploiting so who is going to change this uh, equation now it's basically going to be the workers a kal ko factory ke samne ja ke wahan pe lal jhanda laga do aur bolo ki kal se capitalism khatam but the workers of the factory are not with you in uh, in that struggle can you bring in the revolution you go and give very good speeches put in references by fuko darida everyone who, who you do give a very good speech to the workers say that now revolution has come and uh, we will be making uh, a bet uh, the best world in this uh, the best society in this world and this that but the worker does not understand anything not easy participating in that struggle what will you do and i am not saying in abstract this has actually happened in history during 19 late 1960s in france uh, there was uh, a kind of a student rebellion which happened in france what was the nature of the rebellion that many of the university students late 1960s maoist uh, uprisings were happening all over the world vietnam war was happening in india naxal badi was happening so there was a wave of adventurism across the globe hippie movement was also happening in us at that point of time so the french students said that uh, we are going to bring in revolution now so initially they collaborate uh, when they uh, uh, put up a strike they took hold of their universities kicked out the administrators said universities will be free now whatever you want to uh, study whatever you want to teach whatever you want to do we will do in our universities and the state will be out from our universities now initially the workers and the farmer uh, uh, unions they supported them they said okay we are with you for initially but then the students went to the workers and farmers said you keep silent for the movement you we don't need your support right now we the privileged elite students in uh, paris we will bring the revolution and we will kick out the state and we will bring the revolution for you on the silver uh, plate 
you don't need to do anything about it what happened after that when the workers and the farmers movement uh, took uh, withdrew their support because they were asked to withdraw their support uh, french police was brought on the streets of paris and they beat it black and blue the students many were killed and thrown into the river of uh, paris and uh, next day onwards nothing m m most of those prof uh, students from that time became professors across europe and america when you go and ask them they say oh during my youth time we were also very radical we did this we did that we overtook our university kicked out the state and this that but when you ask what happened out of it ah uh, nothing those were idealist days we were young at that point of time those people we actually call them defeatists that uh, people who had a certain radical conception about the world tried to bring it couldn't bring it because they did not have a concrete analysis and the concrete understanding that who is a revolutionary class how it is to be brought into it. who were just idealists and wanted a revolution and when they were defeated they said revolution cannot come so what we should do is we should try to bring in certain radical changes in whatever capacity we can do this was a turn which we call post modern turn an individualist turn i am telling this because many of the people who we celebrate in academy today including darida fuko and everyone they all are produce uh, products of this historical juncture itself fuko and darida both were part of this uh, student uh, fiasco which happened in uh, paris at that point of time and uh, they were the radicals who were rescued out of that uh, a, a historical movement and brought to us as radical uh, thinkers of the of our time so whenever you are, try to read or understand don't say think that oh this person is whatever this person is, seems radical so it might be it must be true so i should uh, take it at the face value use your own scientific temperament in our fu fundamental duties of the constitution it says we will inculcate and propagate a scientific temperament but we most of the times forget about it so that is something which we should keep always keep in mind so marxism belongs to the revolutionary class and the revolutionary class is that of the workers and the farmers it belongs there itself what we as students at best can do is we can help the marxist struggles in our own limited capacity capacities limited why i'm saying limited because we are not revolutionaries we should be very clear about it that by reading marxism or being a marxist i am not a revolutionary or uh, other people who say that i am a marxist i am a very revolutionary person i might have revolutionary thoughts but i'm not i do not belong to the revolutionary class that is a baseline understanding which we need to understand so that is something which we need to keep in mind then the last part is that uh, if uh, it's about workers and farmers then what is the history of marxist struggles marxism has been on the face of the earth for past 150 years and there have been numerous struggles across the globe and marxism is not just a one country specific it's a workers it's a global movement marx and engels write in the manifesto in the last line workers of the world unite so it's not about uh, we just want our workers to be emancipated there can be no emancipation unless the whole global working class is emancipated one important an uh, analysis of marxism so history of marxist struggle i would say in india that what is marxism if you want to understand through its own functioning in india we all must have read about or might have heard about uh, telangana struggle or tebhaga struggle telangana tebhaga struggles were actually peasant struggles against landlordism tebhaga means uh, that uh, we will pay earlier under feudalism what uh, we discussed earlier that the feudal has uh, the feudal landlord has land he asks the farmers to work upon it and says that okay you give me one third of your produce so earlier this uh, farmers were asked nearly half or say two thirds of the uh, uh, produce as a rent but tebhaga struggle said we will only pay one third and not more and it was a armed struggle which happened in bengal pre independence uh, telangana struggle was com to completely kick out landlords from the uh, place it happened in telangana and at that point of time it was under nizam's rule even today's farmer agitation which you are seeing today it has it is not just uh, led by it's not just 
a marxist struggle per se but so there is not marxist struggle marxism is science science whatever movements are happening a marxist person will go there with their own understanding and politics and will try to contribute to that struggle there is no puritan revolutionaries or puritan marxism that you have to be from this particular caste class gender background with this particular understanding with this amount of particular amount of political correctness which is daily updated by instagram only then you are a revolutionary otherwise you are not that is not how marxism works or even any kind of a social movement works even in the struggle if you see in the farmer struggle this is my last uh, contribution just for 2 minutes even in the struggle if you see there are farmers from different backgrounds social backgrounds i i mean from punjab haryana up uttarakhand mp rajasthan telangana tamil nadu maharashtra bihar every state uh, from every state farmers are participating but one thing which each farmer would say that ladai kiske khilaf hai adani and ambani who is modi modi is uh, adani sambani dalal uska agent hai adani ambani ka they all understand that the fight is against the corporate loot and the corporate loot is not just upon farmers it's in each sector the trains which are being sold off privatized the roads which are being privatized ports which are being privatized the kind of monopolies which are being created in every sector be telecom or any other sector the psus which are being sold off everything is interconnected and it is all meant to benefit a handful of capitalists this is the baseline struggle a uh, baseline under, of understanding which this movement has brought forward and it's not just an understanding which just the left has of course and whenever we go to uh, gazipur border or other places or, or other protest sites i find many bku people bhartiya kisan union people they come and tell us that the so comrade whatever you were saying 30 years back that when liberalization was happening in india that all the corporate loot will happen and uh, uh, your farms will be taken uh, will be controlled by uh, the big corporates and corporate farming will come into being we thought that you are idiots you are just uh, fancy soviet era hangover people and uh, you don't understand what is uh, what are benefits we are going to get from market economy but today we understand that whatever you were saying was actually correct it would does not mean that we are correct and our egos are satisfied it only means that the marxist analysis was correct that where we are heading for uh, to and it has become into four uh, ground because now it has come into it has wo pratyaksh ho gaya jisko bolte hain evident it has become that it has become so evident today that even a person who does not have read marx or knows about marx will tell you that the fight is against sadani and ambani in corporate so this is the ba- the profound understanding of marxism and here i would end that uh, the lecture itself and if anyone has any discussion que- points questions suggestions you are free to uh, contribute uh, thank you comrade prabhu that was very comprehensive the series of topics that we have covered today from uh, you know idealism and then materialism and all mode of uh, production so i think uh, doubts would are very genuine process of learning so if any comrade or anybody has any doubt do ask or write in the chat box we'll read out the question या तो सबको सब कुछ समझ आ गया है या फिर कुछ भी समझ नहीं आया आई थिंक इट वाज वेरी कॉम्प्रिहेंसिव नो 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 डाउट एवरीबॉडी मस्ट हैव अंडरस्टूड अम दैट्स ओके इफ नोबडी हैज द डाउट एंड कॉम्रेड प्रभु हैज रिटन द बुक नेम इन द चैट बॉक्स आई विल आल्सो फ्लोट दिस इन अनदर ऑल द व्हाट्सएप ग्रुप्स आल्सो सो uh that is very informative that was very informative session for all of us and uh, thank you so much for being here everybody and uh, comrade prabud 
and giving those uh, you know making us aware about all the topics and that was very deep discussion i should say and uh, everybody must have paid attention so we have got a lot of knowledge today about the topic what is marxism indeed it so thank you so much here i would like to end the meeting and it was nice contribution of everybody's time i think there is a question okay by mandeep how should we see that state will wither away by marx so yeah let me say one thing that when we say state will wither away one thing how not to approach marxism is through quotes never never just pick up a quote and under, uh, try to understand it always read the whole text for example there is a uh, very important uh, very famous uh, saying that uh, religion is the opium of the masses by uh, marx uh, and everyone says oh so marx is all should be a thief because marx is a religion is the opium of the masses but they don't read the next sentence which is that it is eye of the, the oppressed that the oppressed creature uh, uh, resorts to religion as a form of its side as a form of its say catharsis so understanding that dialectical relationship is very important that it religion is an opium but it also plays a, a very important social role now when we are saying that uh, the state will wither away what marx actually meant by it is that when we uh, achieve uh, scientific socialism by overthrow of capitalism for example it's a very uh, theoretical uh, understanding very simple basic uh, equational understanding for example if that capitalist who was uh, taking 9 crore worth of uh, surplus value is kicked out now 10 crore worth of uh, whole produce it has to be distributed among everyone so state will be necessary because it will allocate resources it will make uh, decide that who all need homes at what time who all need what medicines at what time will build hospitals and everything the state formation will not just vanish in one day but what marx uh, and what marxists also understand that the role of the state state is a social institution and it's a trotsky's definition that state is a social institution imposed superimposed upon the society from above and it uh, uh state is also a mechanism uh, to control by the ruling class so for example if you are uh, pr uh, protesting for your rights any kind of a protest be it student protest anything what does state do it brings in policemen if you try to uh, go into uh, dharna or anything it will beat you black and blue why does it do that because it is a, 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 a uh, its task is to maintain the social order of the ruling class and any kind of uh, opposition which comes to it has to be crushed that's a task of the state but when you enter into a socialist uh, society where the state's role is to redistribute society uh, rationally redistribute the resources among all the people that repressive uh, that repressive nature of state is uh, diminished it goes uh, with us away in that sense and even the roles uh, the redistributive role which the state has to do those will be uh, very slowly and slowly become a very norm, uh, a normal uh, uh, processes of life for example everyone will understand that okay this person needs home so from this we have to take resources you won't need a police i'm not saying that under socialism everyone will become good that there will be no crimes every no one will steal or no one will kill or no one will do that for that you will need a certain kind of a state but slowly and slowly it has and it is historically proven that in places uh, where uh, which enjoy a certain amount of socialist uh, policies or a so, uh, socialist redistribution resources crime rates have dropped be it in norway be it in cuba be it in other places they have dropped considerably because simple si baat hai gaon mein ladai kis liye hoti hai do bhaiyo ke beech mein zameen ke upar tune meri zameen ke ek ate nali kaise bana di mera kaise sab ghar le liya ye le liya agar private property ki wo jad koi khatam karte hain aadhe se aadha crimes karne ka motive hi khatam ho jata hai या आपको किसी को चोरी करने के लिए डकैती करने के लिए जरूरत ही नहीं तो दैट इज वाई वेन वी से स्टेट विल बेदर अब इट्स नॉट जस्ट एन आइडियलिस्ट अंडरस्टैंडिंग इट्स अ वेरी रेशनल अंडरस्टैंडिंग दैट द नेचर विच स्टेट ऑफ स्टेट अंडर कैपिटलिज्म विल बी कम्प्लीटली ट्रांसफॉर्म्ड इन टाइम एंड वेन इट इज कम्प्लीटली ट्रांसफॉर्म्ड इट्स नीड विल ऑल्सो कैथ डिमिनिश विद टाइम
Uh, thank you so much, everyone. I think there is anything else in the chat box. Okay, so that's about just a prior conversation. So I think we need to end the meeting and thank you so much for being here, everybody. Now I would request everyone to please leave the meeting.